Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Any questions about the written homeworks? So you just turned a number of them in. This is where you turn them in. Um, <coughs> notably, to my sadness, uh, <laughs> nobody mentioned the the coffee stain I put on the first one. <laughs> I was wondering if I did that or if that was I got the pants. Yeah, I just I put it on there. <laughs> just <laughs> I thought it was funny. Actually what it's for is that when when academics are writing draft versions of their paper, or if they're writing papers that are not meant to be taken seriously, if they're meant to be a joke then you put a big coffee stain on the first page so that you don't accidentally turn in to a journal a draft or something like that or people don't accidentally take it too seriously a big coffee stain is that you covering yourself right now or is that like no that's just me explaining why why there should be a coffee stain at all in academic papers cuz it's just an option in the, when i'm typing Papers up. It's just an option. Like, put a coffee stain. Okay, let's put a coffee stain. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so there's these homeworks, these written homeworks due. Um, Monday, six days from now, there's going to be a quiz, quiz number one. And it's going to be more or less over those written homeworks. Okay, and you, you will be able to take quiz number one between Monday and um, Saturday. The Monday that's six days from now and the Saturday that's six plus five days from now. Okay. <clears throat> um, there is a quiz open now. It's open, it, it was open yesterday morning and it'll be open until Saturday. You need to take it, it's for a grade. Okay, but there's no math on it. It's just more or less, can you figure out how to register for the quiz and then get to the testing center with your photo ID and successfully tell them that I'm here to take the quiz and after all of that remember your net ID and bubble it in on the sheet if you can do all of that then you get full credit for quiz number zero okay it's just it's a procedural thing just so you can figure out how to how to get over there then the real quizzes that is to say the quizzes that have math exercises on them start next Monday so, under normal circumstances, there, there, there was an online homework due last night, okay? and under normal circumstances, it, that would be the end of it. But as it happens, you probably re received the email, the, 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 whatever it's called, My Math Lab, even though UTD, e even though you can locate, you can find the physical location of someone by their IP. And even though I made that homework from UT Dallas, which is obviously in the Central Standard Time Zone, they, they set it up by default in the Eastern. So, <laughs> which meant that the homework, though I advertised it to be due at 11.59 p.m., was in fact actually due at 10.59 p.m. because it was 11.59 in the Eastern Time Zone. Lovely. Okay, well. So I extended the due date for homeworks zero and one to, to tomorrow night. So, so there's that. And I've made sure all of the future times will be in central time. So that's good. Uh, but they'll all, from now on, they'll all be due at 11.59 p.m. on the date stated. Yes? Is due today? Okay, well then that, super easy, like, you know, like Okay. Okay, so then that that'll be fine then. So uh, any questions about the online homework? So so you should you should do the online homework, that's sort of like dribbling in and out of the cones for soccer practice with only your left foot. You know, that kind of thing. That's what the that's what my math lab is about. The written homework is like Let's see what the quiz might be like, and then there's the quiz. 
Okay, on Thursday, you're going to turn in another batch of written homeworks. Then, the quiz number two will be over those, more or less. Okay, and we're just going to keep going all through the semester until we've accumulated a whole bunch of online homeworks and written homeworks and quizzes. And then we'll have the final exam. Any question about the way the course will go? Well, there's some that are already, that are posted already, and they're due Thursday. So six, seven, eight, and nine are, have been posted for s since Thursday, since last Thursday, and they're due Thursday. This t two days from now. Then tonight, I'll post written homeworks corresponding to tonight's lecture. There's going to be written homeworks due every time. Yes. Key? Uh, it's fine. <laughs> They'll be posted tonight. So the key to the PDF, the, the PDF of the key to those, to those homeworks right there will be posted tonight, as well as a video of me making that key. Okay, so, you know, I, I can't, I can't, I have difficulty imagining how more I could prepare you for the for the task of taking the quiz. So you, you have to do your part. The quiz is the, is the majority of your grade. Okay, so the online homework, I think, is configured to have infinitely many attempts per question. <laughs> so, okay. Then you've got the written homework where you've just got the one attempt. Okay, but it doesn't count a lot. And then I show you a key, and then you have to take the quiz, and that's where it really counts. Okay? Any other questions about the format? of the course. Okay, so last week we kind of reviewed the highlights of differential calculus. Uh, we talked about the derivative, its geometric interpretation as the slope of the tangent line, and the various <coughs> rules associated to the derivative like the product rule and the chain rule and, and, and other things. Uh, then we had some homeworks over it, fine. So now we're in section 7.1. So the syllabus for Applied Calculus 1 says that you went over chapter 7, all, all, essentially all of chapter 7. And so here we are in chapter 7. So this really should be review, but this kind of is the natural place to begin Calculus 2. Okay, so this is called antiderivatives. Okay. So before we get too far into it, I want to be clear that, that um, since you did go through most of chapter 7 probably in calculus 1 you probably heard this other word integral and you have these two words floating around in there in your head antiderivative and integral and it may not be entirely clear why there's two words is there any difference okay and 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 all things like that and the answer is yes there is a stark difference and even if your calculus 1 instructor did not did not make the distinction quite clear. I will make I will make and enforce the distinction the distinction to be quite clear. Okay, so right now we're talking about something called antiderivative. Okay, there's a there's a separate notion of something called integral, and we're not talking about that presently. So in order to get the topic going, I'd like for you to consider mm, a function like this. So how about f of x is 3x squared plus 5. So it's just a garden variety function. Okay, and remember, recall that sort of the, the conceptual device, the conceptualization I want you to have for a function is it's like a machine that takes inputs and produces outputs. So suppose for this particular machine, the F machine, if we were to give it input 2, what would its output be? 
17, right? Because that means, that means that you should replace the x with a 2. So this would be 3 multiplied by 2 squared and then add 5. And then with the powers of arithmetic, that's 17. Okay, then I could ask you to plug in a variety of other things. But let's just not do that. So what I want you to see is that the F machine What kind of what kind of thing does can you plug into the F machine? So like bananas, is that what you put in? Is you put in bananas on this side? What do you put in over here? Numbers, right? So for example, we plugged in a two. You could have and you could have plugged in a, a an eight. Eight's also a number, or a pi. Okay, but you can't plug in giraffes because those aren't numbers. Right? So what I want you to see is that this is the kind of machine, this is the kind of machine where the input has to be a number. <clears throat> what kind of thing is the output? Also a number. Okay, so in some sense, this machine is kind of really simple in comparison to, say, uh, a particular station on an assembly line because the inputs to the stations on an assembly line could be things like nuts and bolts and car doors and windows and things like that, and then you assemble them into something bigger. That's far more complicated. We're talk all, this, all that this is is you just... You're allowed to plug numbers in, and the numbers come out. Okay? So, <clears throat> the set of all numbers, of all numbers, is called, what is the name for the set of all numbers? That's something they, that is required knowledge to be in calculus two. Starts with R and begin and and ends with reals. There you go. So the set of all numbers is called the reals. And how do you denote that set? That is to say, how do you write down the set of reals? Well, it's written with an R, but because this set is the set of numbers that we do all of our math and physics and stuff like that with, not all, not all math and physics, but all of the math that's in this class, because, it's, because it has that special status and station, you don't write it with just a regular R, you write it with a fancy R. So it's an R that looks like this. So it's just like a normal R, except for that leg on the back is a box <laughs> looking thing. So the style of write, writing this way is called blackboard bold. Because in a textbook when you, or in a math paper or something like that, it, when you're denoting the reals, typically you write the reals in bold. But I don't have a bold pencil or a bold hand or whatever would be necessary to write a bold character on this sheet of paper. So this is the stylistic convention to mean that I'm writing in bold. That's what that means. And it's called blackboard bold, which is funny, right? Because blackboard means chalkboard that happens to be black. And then we don't even use those anymore. We use whiteboards. But then I'm not even using a whiteboard either. I'm using paper. So it's all, <laughs> you know, there's going to there's gonna come a time when people have no idea why it's called blackboard bold is what I'm worried about. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. <laughs> OK, denote it as the reels. By the way, the, whole, the entire name reels is a joke in itself, right? Because in college algebra, in college algebra, you should have learned that besides the reels, there's another kind of number that's apparently interesting. What kind? The imaginary numbers, right? 
So the way that that happened was, is that back in the day, there used to not be mathematicians over here, and physicists over here, and chemists over there. They used to not be different people. They used to all be the same people, and they weren't called mathematician or physicist or chemist. All of them together were collectively called natural philosophers. So as a result, the most famous mathematician and the most famous physicist is the same person. And he wasn't a mathematician or a physicist. <laughs> he was a natural philosopher. What's his name? No one? Isaac Newton, right? In the time of Newton, there were no mathematicians. And there were no physicists. They were all called natural philosophers. So, <laughs> so the way complex numbers came around is that the people who were natural philosophers but who would be one day mathematicians, they said, you know what? I wonder what would happen if negative one did have a square root. And I'm just going to pretend that it does, and I'm just going to see where that goes. And then the people who would be physicists said, you know what? You can't play in our sandbox if you're going to talk that way. <laughs> you're going to have to leave. Because uh, that's all. That's just your imagination which is more or less how those numbers got to be called imaginary. And then mathematicians, as a joke, called the, other, <laughs> called the original numbers the reals, as opposed to imaginary, as a joke. <laughs> right? But then mathematicians get the last laugh. Because the most, today, the most important physics of the small scale is quantum mechanics. And what kind of numbers do you have to use in quantum mechanics? complex numbers, <laughs> the same ones that they t said were imaginary. So mathematicians won the, ga won the game, won the day, after all. OK, so back on task here. So this function, this function f, so f has signature. So this is a new word that I'm using math word, has signature reals to reals, which is to say that f is a function whose input must be a real and whose output must be a real. It takes reals as input, produces reals as output. Okay? Now, <clears throat> this is in contrast to something like the following. Suppose that I ask you to do this. The derivative of, um, <clears throat> say, 8x cubed plus 10x. Well, what's the answer to this? Mm-hmm. Plus 10. And I suspect that there's no uh, argument here that this is totally unsurprising. But I want to point out something to you. That that I I asked you to differentiate something and, and from that you produced something else. What kind of something did I ask you to differentiate? What kind of thing is this? Is this a number? Can it turn to x squared? Yes. Thank you. So what kind of thing is this? Is it a number? Is it a giraffe? What is it? This is a function. This is a function. <clears throat> it's a function. And what kind of thing is, so that's the input. What kind of thing is the output? Another function. So what I want you to see is, in, by way of comparison to this very simple kind of object, a machine that takes an input, a number as input, and produces a number as output, the derivative is also a machine, a function.
What kind of things does it accept as input? Function. And it produces a function as output. So the derivative is a function. <laughs> the derivative is a function. Its inputs are functions and its outputs are functions. A function of a function gives you a function. That's kind of incredible <laughs> to think about, right? Okay. Well, these are both functions, but they're they're wildly different from each other. So your whole the whole of calculus one, the whole of calculus one is taking this machine, the derivative machine, defining it properly, and figuring out some neat consequences of it. tangent lines, rates of change, uh, various things like that. And figuring out what happens if you, what happens if you, uh, for the input function, what if this is actually the sum of two functions? If the input is the sum of two functions. Or if the input is the composition of two functions. Or if the input is actually the product of two functions. How does the derivative machine work then? Well, when the input is the product of two functions, the, the derivative machine does the product rule. When the input is the composition of functions, it does the chain rule. All kinds of interesting things. Calculus 1 is the study of this. Calculus 2, calculus 2, about half of calculus 2, is saying, well, what if, <laughs> what if we saw this function come out? What if we were standing over here? What if we were standing right here, and we couldn't see the other side? And we saw a function come out, and we said, you know what? I'm going to push that one back in, <laughs> and I want to know what comes out on the other side. What if you try and run this machine in reverse? What would happen? Would it work? Could you make it work? And the answer is, it works up to a point. It works in a certain way, and we're going to see that way. What happens if you try and run this, fun run this machine in reverse? That's what we're going to study. So that being said now, so DDX, the derivative operation, has signature. And this is, you don't, this is not important. I'm going to write it down, okay, but, but it can be kind of confusing. Has signature. Just so you can see it for completeness. What it means is that this is the kind of thing that it takes as input. It takes an input. It takes a function as input and produces a function as output. Interesting. Okay. So we're going to see what is, how do we run this machine in reverse. So the name, so this is called the derivative machine, or the derivative function, if you like. Running the machine in reverse, that's called antiderivative. Okay? That means to run the derivative backwards. So, we need some definitions. <clears throat> this is the definition of antiderivative. So, let little f and big F be functions. following are equivalent. Equivalent. So one, <clears throat> the derivative of big F is little f. <clears throat> okay, the derivative of 
big F is little f. <coughs> so what I mean is that big F and little f are functions such that this sentence would be true. Okay. Two. You could render this sentence, this sentence in English, in the following way. Uh, the derivative of big F of X is little f of x. So, now we have to go back to grade school, grammar. So, do you remember in, in grade school when you were having to look at sentences and then the teacher was saying, okay, now which one is the verb <coughs> and which one is the object and which is the subject and tell me the predicate and, and all these things. Do you remember that fond time of your life? <laughs> well, it, all sentences, at least simple sentences, have to have a subject, a verb, and an object. And in English, that's the order that they come in. So English is said to be SVO, subject, verb, object. Another la major language that is also SVO is Chinese. It is SVO. But not all languages are SVO. So, for example, Turkish is SOV, which is to say, they say the subject first, then the object, and then the verb. Okay. Well, so in this sentence, <coughs> the subject is the derivative of big F. That's the subject. Is is the verb, and this is the object. So the subject is is the noun which is performing the action, the verb, and the object is the noun which is being acted upon. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch the order. I'm going to switch the subject and the object so that they're in different positions and the sentence is going to have to be rearranged as a result. So three. <coughs> An antiderivative of little f is big F. So notably what I want you to see is that the big F and the little f, they switch positions in the sentence. Okay, so you can see that they switched positions. <clears throat> but other things in this sentence had to also change to accommodate that. So one of the things that had to change <clears throat> is that this is, this, uh, is the, the derivative <clears throat> is what you do to big F. The thing that you do to little f is antiderivative. So, so antiderivative. But something else changed also. So notice that the had to change to an. So let's, let's see why that, why that had to happen. Let's think about this for a moment. So what part of speech do, do, do the words the and an belong to? What are those called? <laughs> so so y'all got more than you bargained for, right? This is not... <laughs> I was told this was a math class. <laughs> what? Uh, well, so I agree that this is in is in present tense, but the and an. So there's so the, an, and a are all the same part of speech. The article. They're all called articles. And the only difference between a and an is so that we have. Uh, vowel agreement. So there's really no difference between a and an. So there's really just two articles, the and an. What is the distinction between them? Right. In particular, in particular, uniqueness versus potential 
non-uniqueness. Which is to say, when you say the derivative of big F is little f, that means that little f is the derivative, that's the one, and there can be no other. There isn't another one. That's it. Whereas, when you say an antiderivative, what you're saying, what that means, is that among the possibly many antiderivatives of little f is big F. So what that means is that somehow this sentence is saying that there's uniqueness involved, and this sentence is saying that there's not uniqueness involved. Okay, so we're going to see why that's the case in just a minute. So now, this is the derivative sentence. This is the derivative sentence rendered in English. This is the antiderivative sentence rendered in English. Wouldn't it be nice to have an antiderivative sentence rendered in math instead of English? Right? Because English is a little bit clum clumsy for the purpose of calculating. So this is the way you render the antiderivative sentence in math. So what I'm telling you is that all four of those sentences that are written on the page mean precisely the same thing. It's four different ways to say exactly the same thing. Okay, now let's talk about what this means. <clears throat> So as for the reason why it's non-unique, so suppose I write the derivative of and then equal blah. And suppose that I write a red box right here. And a green box right here. Well, in calculus one, the style of exercise that you were given was structured just like this. Except, uh, well, not except, it was structured just like this, and then what the instructor went on to do is they went in to fill in the red box and then said, now I want you to fill in the green box. So I'll do that now. So something like, okay, the derivative of 3x squared plus 5. Then you should be able to answer this right now without hesitation. So what's the answer? 6x. Right, it's 6x because as for the first thing, you can use the power rule. The 2 comes down, you subtract 1 from the 2, blah, blah, you know. Then the derivative of 5 is 0. So is there any question about this? So I gave you the red box. You, you were to produce the green box. So now, what if I give you something of the same structure? the exact same structure as before, except now, instead of giving you the red box and saying complete this sentence, I'm going to give you the green box and say complete this sentence. I can still say complete this sentence so that it makes mathematical sense. So, so how could you do it? I don't know. I don't know anything about what you're talking about. All that I want you to do is just tell me. Could, could you tell me right now something whose derivative is 2x? Okay. So do you, do you agree that we could write an x squared in that red box? And then that, and then the sentence would be a correct <coughs> sentence. Okay. Now, I would like for you to also, I, w I would like for you to consider the next exercise.
So now, exact same structure as before. And in here, I'm going to write 2x again. And I'm going to say, thank you for your x squared. That was right. I have no objection to it. But I want you to answer this question again, and you're not allowed to use the same answer. x squared plus 1. OK. Now, why does that work? Right, because the derivative of 1 is 0. But do you observe that, as you say, there's nothing particularly special about 1, like as, it's, as, as in its size. The, the only thing that made this work is the fact that 1 is constant. So I could ask you to do this 10 more times, and you could select 10 other constants. Do you observe that it would always work? so long as you put a constant. So what I want you to see is that the general case if I were to put 2x here Every, every conceivable thing that you could put in the red box to make this sentence a correct and complete sentence is of the form x squared plus c, where c is a constant. So now, <clears throat> what I want you to observe is the following, is that these three these three taken together <coughs> it is like we took the derivative machine and we observed a 2x come out on the output side and then we asked ourselves well, what if we were to push that 2x back in? <laughs> what if we were to do that? What could possibly come out on the left? Well, an x squared could come out. An x squared plus 1 could come out. An x squared minus pi could come out. But in general, every, of all the things that could possibly come out, they must be of the form x squared plus c. If you were to push this back in, that 2x back in, and x squared plus c must come out. Okay, So what I'm telling you is that, as a result, when you put a 2x into the antiderivative machine, how do you denote what comes out? as x squared plus c. Now this not non-uniqueness of antiderivative, that's the reason for this change in the article, the change in the language, and antiderivative. And antiderivative of 2x is x squared. And antiderivative of 2x, another antiderivative of 2x is x squared plus 1. Another antiderivative of 2x is x squared plus 12, etc. Okay, good. So that's for the definition. Now, <clears throat> let's have an example. So, could you please tell me what is the antiderivative of 3x squared dx? Which is to say, I want, you to I want you to ask yourself the question. Whose derivative is 3x squared? Can you tell me something that when you differentiate it, you would get 3x squared? x cubed. 
right? If you were to differentiate x cubed, you'd get 3x squared. So the answer is x cubed and then plus a constant. <clears throat> okay. How about, what is the antiderivative of 5 dx? Five x plus a constant because you're asking yourself what kind of thing could I differentiate so that I would get five as a result well five x would fit the bill right five x would work and then plus c to indicate the non-uniqueness of it any question about this one? Okay. Here's another one that you know. How about, what is the antiderivative of the exponential? That is to say, what could you differentiate so that e to x would be the result? e to x. And then, plus a constant. OK. How about one last one before we get to, to making general rules? <clears throat> uh, how about, uh, what about the derivative of, say, mm, the antiderivative of 2x uh, plus 7 dx? Okay, so something was something was wrong and something was right. I don't agree. No, x squared. Sorry. Right. So so, here's this thing, and what I want you to observe is you can kind of do it piece by piece. Can you tell me whose derivative would be two x? X squared. And then whose derivative would be seven? Seven x. So if you were to differentiate this, you'd get that. So that's the answer once we write plus c. Now, <clears throat> the antiderivative machine, the antiderivative function, is what you get when you run the derivative function in reverse mode, if you like. So. The derivative had all kinds of rules associated to it, right? The sum rule, the constant multiple rule, the product rule, the quotient rule, the chain rule, all those things that the, that the derivative had. Well, corresponding to every single one of those rules is an antiderivative anti-rule. So if there's, a, if, there's a, if there's a sum rule for derivatives, and there is, then there's a sum rule for antiderivatives. If there's a chain rule for derivatives, then there's an anti-chain rule for antiderivatives. And we're going to part a big part of this class is going to be going down one at a time all those rules. Oh, you remember the product rule? Well, now we have to do the anti-product rule. Oh, you remember the chain rule? Now we do the anti-chain rule. Oh, blah blah, all these things. Except unfortunately, unfortunately the names for all of the rules in the case of antiderivatives more or less have no bearing on the names, <laughs> no connection to the names as they relate to derivatives. Like the names are just totally like, like people just were drawing names out of a hat. <laughs> it's hard to tell which one is which. So I'll carefully <coughs> explain to you which one, how they correspond. Okay. <clears throat> so. The sum rule. <clears throat> For derivatives, it looks like this. 
If you have two functions and you're going to compute the derivative of the sum, f plus g, and then differentiate, well, how does the derivative interact with the sum? What does it do? So you really do know the answer. It's just, it's prob probably not usually stated so abstractly to you. Well, the derivative distributes just like this. It's the derivative of f of x plus the derivative of g of x. Which is to say, for example, that expression that's between my fingers there. What's its derivative? 2x plus, seven. 2x plus 7. Because I'm asking you to differentiate the sum of x squared and 7x. Well, it's going to be the derivative of that one plus the derivative of that one. That's what this is saying. Derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. That's what it's saying. Well, nicely, Antiderivatives work exactly the same way. The antiderivative of the sum, little f plus little g, is the antiderivative of little f plus the antiderivative of little g. So it's more or less exactly what you thought, exactly what you might expect. And in fact, you already did it here on this example, because I asked you, what is the derivative of 2x plus 7? And we said, well, what's the antiderivative of that one? x squared. And then, what's the antiderivative of that one? 7x. So we already really used that rule. So I think this comes as no surprise. <coughs> so <coughs> there's also. the constant multiple rule. Rule. OK. For derivatives, it's saying that the, the derivative of c multiplied by f of x. So that c could be something like a 5 some constant. What can you do with that constant? It can just pull out. It can be factored out of the derivative so that this is c multiplied by the derivative of f of x. Now this is something that you already know. In fact, this is something that if, you're, if you've done any derivatives whatsoever, <laughs> You've used this rule probably more or less unconsciously, which is to say, could you please tell me, what is the derivative of 10x cubed? Thirty x squared. And then how did you do that? Right. But now, I want to write out all the steps, all the steps that have to occur sequentially in your, in your mind so that you can see them. I'm not asking you to write your answers in this way. I want you to see how they're working. So because that 10 is a constant multiplier, it can be factored out. It can be factored out so that it looks like 10 multiplied by the derivative of x cubed. Then you know the derivative of x cubed because you know the power rule. What is the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared. So that this is 10 multiplied by 3x squared. And then that last expression, that can be simplified, can't it? Yeah. And you could write it as 30x squared. Well. The typical Calculus 2 student at this point jumps from the beginning to the end. But, but don't lose sight of those steps that happen in the middle. 
That's what's really happening. The 10 comes out. You apply the power rule. You perform a simplification. That's the answer. Antiderivative has exactly this same rule. The antiderivative of c times f of x. Oh, I don't want to use c because then it's confusing for because c means something special to you maybe. So I'll use a k. k times f of x dx. So that's some some constant. It could be an eight. It could be a, a negative pi. Whatever you like. What can you do with that constant? It can just be factored out. So it's <coughs> k multiplied by the antiderivative of f of x dx. So <clears throat> what I want you to see is that so far these two rules for derivative and antiderivative are essentially identical. They're essentially identical in that when you add two functions and then differentiate, that's the same as di differentiating first and then adding. And it's the same for antiderivatives. So addition and constant multiplication work identically. Now here's where things get different. power rule. So for derivatives, you should be able to tell me the rule for this. What is the derivative with respect to x of x to exponent n? It is... Mm -hmm. Yes. Of course, that's like, what's the derivative of x cubed? Well, you bring down the 3, and then you subtract 1 from the 3, and get 3x squared. That's what this is saying. That's how it looks like for derivatives. So for antiderivatives, there must be some other rule here. But this is going to be different now. And the reason why it's going to be different is because, remember what antiderivative is. Antiderivative is running the derivative machine in reverse. So that means that if you have steps A, B, C for, for computing a derivative, then you have to do the opposite of C, then the opposite of B, then the opposite of A. You've got to do the same steps, but the reversal of each of those steps and in the reverse order. It's just like if you can think of something simple, like getting dressed, okay? First you put on your, uh, say, socks, and then you put on your shoes. To undo that procedure, do you first take off your socks? No, right? You've got to take the shoes off first. That's the way it is. So you've got to, to take a sock off, there's two procedures, putting a sock on, taking it off putting a shoe on, taking it off. Then if you compose these procedures, putting a sock on and then a shoe, to undo it, you have to take the shoe off and then the sock. So there's two things that occur here. There's multiply by n, and then there's subtract 1 from n. We're going to have to do the opposite of those and in the opposite order. So instead of subtracting 1, we'll have to do what? Add 1. And instead of multiplying, we'll have to divide. Okay, so what I want you to see is that here's something that's not even worth memorizing, but I want to write it down so that you can see it, is that this rule that I wrote immediately above implies some rule here. What is the antiderivative of n multiplied by x to the n minus 1 dx? X to the power of n plus 1? No. Almost. It is? 
just x to n. Because what I want you to see is that these two sentences are identical. All that I've done is change the location of the subject and the object, right? I move, the, <laughs> I move this over here. And I move this one over here. Okay? These two sentences are identical. Now, this one, this antiderivative sentence that I wrote is not actually particularly helpful. <laughs> right? And that's what I meant when I said this is not some this sentence is not something you should memorize. Rather, you should memorize this one. What if you wanted to anti-differentiate x to n dx so that you so that it was something cleaner to look at? Well, what it, when you're computing the derivative of x to n, the derivative now, what is the last thing you do? You subtract one from the exponent. What is the opposite of subtracting one? <coughs> Adding one. And because that's the last thing when you do when you compute the derivative, that is the first thing you must do when you compute the antiderivative. So it will now be x to n plus one. And then there's two things that you must do here. So yes, instead of multiply, you're going to divide. And now it's going to be by this new exponent, n plus 1, and then plus c. <clears throat> so this right here is the power rule for antiderivatives. And if the syllabus for calculus 1 was correct, this is something that you already knew. Now, <clears throat> this rule works for almost every value of n, almost every value. What do I mean by that? Alternatively, what value of n could this not conceivably work for? Negative 1. And why not? Because we have something against negative 1s. Right. If n were negative 1, then negative 1 plus 1 would be 0, and this would not be defined, because division by 0 is not defined. So this power rule for antiderivative only works when n is not negative 1. We're going to have to figure out something else for that, and we'll figure it out by the end of the class. But for now, it's just a mystery. If n is negative 1, we have no idea what to do. Okay, so for example, what is the antiderivative of 5x to 7 dx? So there's two rules at play. One of them is the constant multiple rule. So I'm going to write it this one time, but, but you, you need to get comfortable with it not being written because it's such a minor thing that it's essentially never written. So what I'm saying is that I could factor out that 5. I factored out the 5. The 5 can come out because it's a constant. Can x to 7 come out? No, because it's not constant. So now what I'm saying is, for the, for the moment, because that 5 is out of the field of action, you can, I'll just ask you, what is the antiderivative of x to 7? x to 8 over 8. And then now that 5 just come, just is still there. And then, is that the answer? No, then we need plus c. Right? Good. Any question about this one? <clears throat> okay. How about the antiderivative of, say, 
8 over x cubed dx. It is a constant, so it could be factored out if you like. Would you bring the x thousand to the x thousand? Yes. So I'm going to write something. I'm going to write something that is utterly wrong, utterly and terribly wrong. So. I'm going to write something, <laughs> and I want you to look and see if you wrote it. <laughs> and if you, if you wrote it, then you need to, you know, maybe pay attention real close for the next several minutes, because you're, that may indicate that you're in danger of serious confusion. So I'm going, to, I'm going to write something that's wrong. Okay. So if you're going to copy it, please carefully copy that it's wrong. Okay. So, I see the 8. Oh, okay, I remember the 8s. Uh, they're constant, so they just hang out. So this should be what? Uh, 8x to 4 over 4, right? Like that, plus a constant. So what, <laughs> what went wrong here? Yeah? Right. So, to me, anyway, so let me, let me cross this out and put a sad face on it so that it can never be construed as being correct or something. The what? The coffee stain, yeah. <laughs> That's, I need a stamp where I can... <laughs> so, uh, so, it is like students said, well, I see that I'm doing an antiderivative. And I see an x cubed there, and that kind of looks like that, so I'll just do that. I, just, I see this all the time. I don't know exactly what goes through a student's head when they do it. In this rule right here, that rule, do you see any fractions or divisions or anything like that? No. No. Therefore, this antiderivative, as it's currently written, because it's got that big old division and it's got the x cubed in, in the denominator, that means that this rule, the way this one is written, does not apply. And now, yes, I agree with all of you who are saying, well, you need to blah, blah. So what is it, what is it that I need to do? Very good. 8 multiplied by x to negative 3. Now, that 8 is still a constant. It can still be factored out if you wish, but I'm going to ignore the factoring it out and just apply the power rule to this one. So that would be 8, and then multiplied by what? Yes, x to negative 2, and then over negative 2, and then plus a constant. Any question about this one? Yes? If you, if you want to. Okay, I, you, I don't really require that. So the rule of the game is that please, please don't simplify unless explicitly requested. <clears throat> and it's not that I'll count off if you, if you correctly simplify, but I simply must count off if you attempt to simplify and then you make a mistake. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So how about the antiderivative of the square root of x. Not, not quite. One half, yeah. Remember that radical square root corresponds to fractional exponent one half. What does cube root correspond to? One third. Right. One third. So then now, you may not particularly care for fractions, 
they may be dismayed that they're that they're coming into play here, but nevertheless, the power rule applies to this just the same as anything else. So this would be x. The new exponent would be half plus 1, and then divide by half plus 1. And if you felt compelled to simplify, yes, 1 half plus 1, well, 1 is 2 halves. So 1 half plus 2 halves is 3 halves. So this would be x to 3 halves divided by 3 halves and then plus a constant. Any question about this one? OK. <clears throat> So, are you, you're saying, can, would it be okay for you to make it two thirds? Yeah. yeah, it's fine, but I don't. But I don't. I'm not going to grade that. But but feel free. <clears throat> um, so now, now that it's gotten quiet and boring, I think it's a good time for a joke. So, <clears throat> so when when mathematicians tell jokes, okay, you've got to understand that there's several archetypes. One of the archetypes is the mathematician. And because this is a joke told by a mathematician, the mathematicians are the good ones, right? The, the clever ones, you know, the, that, that kind. The physicists in mathematician jokes, physicists are always, not always, but very, very often a type of person who is smart, a smart person, but they're extremely arrogant about their knowledge, which means that they think that physicists are the smartest people and everybody else can just, you know, go on with their boring lives. That's a, that's a physicist. It's just an archetype. I don't really think that. Okay, and then there's engineers, and engineers are also smart people, but they're overly precise, and they get caught up in totally irrelevant details. So this is a joke about two physicists. So two physicists go to a bar. They go to a bar, and they have a conversation, and they say, you know what? It's so great to be a physicist, because we're the smartest people that are in the society. Isn't it? Can't, and then one of them says to the other, can you believe how, how unintelligent the rest of society is in comparison to us? And then the other one says, you know, I think they may be smarter than, than you let them, than, than you give them credit for. And the first one says, nah, I, I, I just think they're dumb. And he walks off to the bathroom um, to, do, to do his business. And the bartender comes up to the one remaining physicist and says, you know, hello and, and all this. And that physicist says to the bartender, says, you know what? My friend's in the bathroom, but when, when he gets back, I want you to come back. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question, and you're not going to have any idea what I'm talking about. That's fine. It doesn't matter. But I'm going to ask you a question. You'll know it when I ask, and I want you to respond with x cubed over 3. Can you repeat that for me, x cubed over 3? And the bartender says, x cubed over 3. And then, okay, the bartender goes on with his business, and back comes the friend. Okay, so they're there talking and, and having their thing. And then the bartender comes over and he says, you know what, I'm going to prove, the, the, the physicist who had the secret conversation says, you know what, I'm going to prove something to you. I'm going to ask the bartender. Bartender, what is, the, what is the antiderivative of x squared? And the bartender says, x cubed over 3. And that physicist starts to say, see, I told you they're smarter. And the bartender interrupts and says, plus c, you jerk. <laughs> Which is funny because the bartender knew better than either one of them because they're physicists. <laughs> that's, that's the joke. Okay, good. So plus C. So so every time every time that I write plus C in this class, inside in my head I say there's this there's there, I, I write plus C and then in, inside my head it's you jerk. <laughs> that's, that's what I hear. Okay, <clears throat> good. So how about this one?
so now, as a warning, I have given you this exercise to specifically elicit a mistake from you. I'm trying to purposefully make you make a mistake here and now where it doesn't count for any points to see if you're going to make it. Okay. <clears throat> so now I'm going to answer the question. And I'm going to answer it in a horribly, terribly wrong way. It's just wrong. So if you're going to copy it, be sure and copy that it's wrong. So here we go. Well, I see that. That kind of looks like the product rule. So I'll say, I mean the power rule. So I'll say 5x cubed over 3 and then multiplied by, uh, for that one, that'll be 8x to 5 over 5 and then plus c. So if you wrote this, then you are utterly and terribly wrong. Okay? So you don't need to out yourself or anything. But I just want you to see, if you did this, then, then you've made a, a grave mistake. And let's make, it, let's make it right here and now so that you don't do it when it counts. Okay? So this is wrong. Now, this is the antiderivative of a product. The antiderivative of a, of a product. And remember that antiderivative is the reverse procedure of derivative. And doesn't derivative have some really interesting behavior that it does when it, inter when it encounters a product? Isn't there a whole rule associated to that? <laughs> Isn't it called the product rule? <laughs> the product rule, right? And isn't the product rule kind of interesting? So for derivatives, for derivatives, the derivative with respect to x of u product v, that's u prime v plus u v prime, right? And we even talked about it last week as saying that the derivative, the, the, the product rule actually, actually represents the way a rectangle is changing. There's all this interesting stuff around it. And notably, the derivative of a product is not u prime multiplied by v prime. So if you made this error, if you did this, that means that, in a, in a sense, that not only do you misunderstand this, but you also misunderstand the product rule. It's saying both. The product rule doesn't behave this way for derivatives, so neither could the antiderivative. Okay? Now, to make this right, I'll ask a simple question. <clears throat> Which class did you take first? Algebra or calculus? Algebra. You took algebra first. And generally speaking, in a calculus question, in a calculus exercise, you should perform all permissible and relevant algebraic simplifications before you do any calculus steps whatsoever. All, all algebra simplifications possible, do them first. This thing we want to anti-differentiate. Can it be algebraically simplified? Yeah. Right? So we could say, OK, well, I'll commute the constants to the front so that it looks like 5 times 8 and then times x squared times x to 4. You probably wouldn't do it like this. You probably wouldn't write this step. That's fine. But when you combine the constants, what do you get? 40. And then when you combine the x's, what do you get? x to 6. So does everyone agree that I haven't performed any calculus whatsoever? No calculus has occurred. I performed all of the permissible algebraic steps. So now that, now that I've done that, what is the antiderivative then? Well, that 40 just hangs out. And then what? Very good. x to 7 over 7, and then plus c. Now, as for the wrong answer, if we were to, to simplify that, 
what would be the exponent for the x? It'd be 8, right? Because here's three of them, and here's five more of them. So it'd be x to 8. The correct answer has, how, has what exponent? 7. Do you observe that they're not even close? So it is generally a rule in calculus exercises. You perform all permissible and relevant algebraic simplifications before doing any calculus steps whatsoever. Any question about this one? OK. So how about this exercise? Uh, suppose that <clears throat> the derivative of h of x is 8x plus 3, and that the h evaluated at 4 is equal to, um, say, 1326. Suppose I give you these two pieces of information. Now my request of you is I want you to find h of x. Now don't be misled. I gave you, did I give you h of x? No. What, did I, what function did I give you? I gave you its derivative. I gave you its derivative. But I gave you a little more than its derivative. I, I gave you its derivative, and I also gave you a value of that function at a particular point. I said, when you plug in 4, you should get 1326. OK. Well, the way that you solve this exercise is this is the information that you know. You know that the derivative of h of x is h prime of x. I mean, that's practically the definition. So how could, you, how could you rewrite this sentence without the derivative operator, but with the antiderivative operator? How do you write this with antiderivatives instead of derivatives? Well, this is just like solving equations. So we, wanna, we want the h and the h prime to stay on their sides. So notice that the h was on the left, and it's still on the left. The h prime is on the right, it's still on the right. What we want to move sides is the d dx, the derivative. So when you move the derivative to the other side, what does it become? Antiderivative. <coughs> Which is to say, when you, take, when you take the derivative and you make it switch sides, it switches sides like this. And again, this is practically by definition. Suppose that I gave you a function. So suppose that I had a function, and then I differentiated it. How could I get the original function back? By anti-differentiating it, right? Suppose I had an amount of money, and I divided it by 2. How could I get back to the original amount of money? Multiply by 2. Suppose that I had, suppose that I had uh, five books, and then I added four more books. How could I get back to the original amount of books? Subtract four books. <coughs> right? 
How do you get the original function? You anti-differentiate its derivative. OK. So the antiderivative of 8x plus 3 dx. Well, what is the antiderivative of 8x plus 3? Four x squared plus three x plus c. <laughs> right. <laughs> so now, we've almost got h. We've almost got it. But there's something that's uncertain about our answer. What's uncertain? The c, right? We don't know what what the c is supposed to be. At least not yet. How will we know when we have the right c? when you plug in 4 and you get 1326. Uh, That's how we'll know. So to determine determine the value of C. We will use this information. That's how we'll know when we have the right C. Which is to say, you will get 1326 you should get 1326 when you plug in 4. That's what that information is saying. Well, we have a formula for H. So we could say that, well, that's 1326 should be equal to 4 multiplied by 4 squared plus 3 multiplied by 4 plus C. And then that's a calculator thing there for me. So 4 times 4 squared plus 3 times 4. Uh, so that's 76. So 1, 3, 2, 6 is 76 plus C. And then we can subtract 76 from both sides. 1250. is C. Therefore, what's the answer to the question? Very good. H of x is 4x squared plus 3x plus 1250. Now, if you're not sure about that, you could verify this by two simple things. In the first place, if you plug in 4, are you going to get 1326? Yeah, you will. You could check it right now. Furthermore, yeah, for, furthermore, if you differentiate this, what do you get? 8x plus 3, as required. So now, this seems like kind of an abstract question, but I want to make sure that this can be made uh, understandable to you. Like, what, what, how could this possibly have any bearing on my life? <laughs> okay. Well, imagine it's Friday, and, uh, and you call your friend and say, hey, where's the party at? I heard y'all are doing calculus problems. And I want to get in on some of that, <laughs> or whatever, or, what, or whatever, you know. And and this calculus problem working friend of yours gives you really precise directions. It says something like, "I want you to proceed four meters to the west, 
and then I want you to proceed exactly 387 meters to the north. And then blah, 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 whole bunch of steps. Extremely precise. Okay. And then you faithfully carry out these instructions. Right? Okay. Blah, 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 blah. And then you carry out all these instructions and you look around and you're in the middle of a field. Notably not at a party. And you call your friend and you say, hey, I followed your instructions. <laughs> And uh, I'm not at the party. And your friend says, oh, I forgot to tell you. You need to start at the subway. <laughs> oh, yeah, OK, great. I'll go back to the subway and carry out all those instructions again. <laughs> this is the detailed step-by-step -step instructions. Turn left, proceed north, blah, 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 all of this. That's what this is saying. But it doesn't matter how precise, even if it's down to the millimeter, if the instructions are, sell, are telling you, move to the left so far, move to the north so far, it doesn't matter how precise those instructions are if they don't tell you where to start. That's what this is. This is start at the Walmart or whatever. OK, good. So that's what these two are. So similarly, even if your friend very carefully told you where to start and then didn't give you the correct instructions on what to do from there, it's both of these are required. So it's the exact same thing here. Abstractly, both of these are required to recover the original function. Good. Any question about this? Okay. So, for example, uh, no, not example. Yeah. Mark. So we have the exponential rule. <clears throat> so, for derivatives. What's the derivative of e to x? e to x. Okay. So that's if, that's if you're differentiating the natural exponential, the exponential with the natural base. And if you happen to be dealing with an unnatural base, the derivative with respect to x of a to x at where a is potentially something else, like 10 to x or something like that, what is the derivative here? <laughs> it's on the homework. I literally typed it on the homework. That one that you turned in right there. <laughs> it's right there. What is it? It's a to x. And then times the natural log of a. Now, are these two rules, are these two things in agreement with each other? Because like this one is saying, if you're differentiating 10 to x, then the answer should be 10 to x <coughs> multiplied by the log of 10. That's what it's saying. And that should work for any base, which means it should also work for base e, right? Like if we were to substitute the a for an e? Ah, very good, right? If this was e to x, then this would be e to x times the log of e. But that's OK, because the, the log of e is 1, right? Good. So these rules really are in agreement with each other. And notably, notably the natural exponential multiplied by a constant, like 5 e to x, is the only function that is its own derivative. The derivative of 5 e to x is also 5 e to x. Whereas every other function, when you differentiate it, you get some other function. So you get something else, which is the subject of a joke. So let's have a joke. <laughs> so the exponential function, e to x, and a constant function are walking down the street. And then all of a sudden, the constant function screams out in horror, says, oh no, because 
the constant function c is walking straight toward them is the derivative. Why would the, deri why would the derivative scare the constant function so much? Because what would happen if the derivative gets hold of the constant function? What's the derivative of a constant? Zero, right? Oh no, right? If the derivative gets me, I'm going to be turned into a zero. And then the, then the exponential function says, <laughs> well, I'm not worried about that derivative operator because I'm the exponential function, right? Because the derivative of e to the x is e to x. And so the exponential function says, you just stick with me and we'll be fine. And so the exponential function walks straight up to the derivative operator and says, it's nice to meet you. I'm the exponential function, e to x. And the derivative says, it's nice to meet you. I'm the derivative operator, d dt. That's the punchline. <laughs> That's the punchline. Why is that funny? <laughs> Why is it funny? Well, what's the derivative with respect to x of e to x is e to x. But what's the derivative with respect to t of e to x? Zero, right? <laughs> because it's a different variable. <laughs> So the exponential thought it was safe, <laughs> but, but not really. OK, so now, <laughs> now, just as a side note, I challenge you to come up with a joke that's entertaining <laughs> in, in a calculus course. It's a, it's a tall order. OK. <clears throat> so the corresponding antiderivative rule is then, I mean, we even already wrote it. The antiderivative of e to x dx is what? e to x plus a constant. That's hap if you happen to be anti-differentiating the natural exponential. But if you're anti-differentiating some other exponential, the antiderivative of a to x dx, now what's the answer? Not quite. So you will get a to x. So, so you, have to do, you have to do the opposite thing of this one. So just like you get a to x back, you'll, you'll again get a to x. For the derivative, what do you have to do? Yeah, for, this, for, for the derivative, you have to multiply by log a. So for antiderivative, you have to divide by log a. So for example, I could ask, well, what's the antiderivative of, um, say, <laughs> let's do this one first antiderivative of 2 to x dx. OK, so I'm going to write something that's terribly and horribly wrong. And I'm going to do it so that you can see it and hopefully be inoculated against it and never do it <laughs> where it counts. OK, so I'm going to write something. It's wrong. Well, that's 2 to x plus 1 over x plus 1, plus a constant. What, what went wrong here? It's 2 to the x, not 2x. Right, it's, it's 2 to x and not x to 2, right? So specifically, here's two functions, and they look visually kind of similar. They look kind of similar. But this one is a polynomial, and that one is an exponential. So they're, they're two totally different kinds of functions. They're two totally different. 
Notably, this is a variable base. The base is a variable, and the exponent is a constant. Variable to constant. And this one is a constant base and a variable exponent, so constant to variable. They look similar, but they're entirely different. And what this, this is wrong, this is wrong because student inappropriately tried to use the power rule, I suppose, right? Because if, if you could use the power rule, it would look kind of like that. So it's like the wrong pattern got matched or something. So no, you can't do that. Rather, you have to use this one. So, so what's the answer then? Mm -hmm. 2 to x divided by natural log 2 and then plus a constant. Okay, so notably the power rule only applies, only applies when the base is a variable and the exponent is a constant. And the exponent isn't negative one. <laughs> and the exponential rule applies when you're dealing with exponentials. Okay, <clears throat> good. So now, let's deal with that case, that special case of the power rule when n is negative 1. When n is negative 1, we can't use the power rule, which is to say that here's the power rule, the antiderivative of x to n dx is x to n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus a constant whenever n is not negative 1. Can't do it when n is negative 1. So in the specific case that n is negative 1, <coughs> that is to say it looks like this, x to negative 1 dx. Well, how could you write x to negative 1 without a negative exponent? Yeah, put it in the denominator. So then it would look like this. Antiderivative of 1 over x dx. What I want to point out to you is that using the knowledge that we currently have, the knowledge that, that we've talked about in this class, I'm not talking about other knowledge that you might have from other classes. Using the knowledge that we have in this class, you have no way to answer, to finish this, to say the antiderivative is whatever. For this one, you're stuck. So that's what we're going to talk about right now. How do you answer this one? OK. So now, do you know something whose derivative looks like 1 over x? Log, right? Remember, you've got the derivative mm -hmm. of log. So. <coughs> There's some surprising things that happen here. So this is called the logarithm rule. Logarithm rule. So where derivatives are concerned, typically the logarithm rule is written in this way. That the derivative of the logarithm of x is also is, is 1 over x. But that's actually, that is true. There's nothing untrue about it. But you can actually do much better than this. And I want to show you how, how you can do much better than this as follows. <clears throat> well, just for fun, let's compute the derivative of the logarithm of, say, 3x. Well, what is the derivative of the logarithm of 3x? Not quite, almost. <clears throat> so it's not 1 over 3x <clears throat> because, because this 
and this because the red and the green box are not the same that means that you must use the chain rule right notice in this example the red and the green box are the same same so no chain rule is required so for the present example you have to do the chain rule which is to say you have to multiply by the derivative of 3x Well, what is the derivative of 3x with respect to x? It's 3. So this would be 1 over 3x multiplied by 3. But then what? Then the 3 is canceled, right? And it's just 1 over x. OK, now wait a second. That's a bit disturbing, isn't it? That's a little disturbing. We've got, you're, you're telling me that the log of, the derivative of the log of x is 1 over x, and the derivative of the log of 3x is also 1 over x. But now you have to carry out this implication and notice that there's nothing special about 3. I could have replaced that 3 with a 6, and it'd still be 1 over x. I can replace the 3 with a, with a 6 million. The derivative of the natural log of 6 million x would still be 1 over x. Because the only thing that's special about 3 in this context is that it is a constant. How could that possibly be? Well, I agree with that, but then how does... I, I'd agree with that entirely. But how does that... How does that jive with the rest of this? Because it seems like this is totally weird. I mean, how would this work? And I think in the end, the most satisfying answer comes from the algebraic rules for logarithms. Do you remember the algebraic rules for logarithms? Not really. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> so those are from college algebra. So what I want you to remember for example, what is the natural log of product AB? Exactly. So the log of A plus the log of B. And there's other rules, and we'll, let's just write them for, com for completeness sake. The log of A divided by B, what, what is that? Mm-hmm. Very good. And then there's the log of A with exponent B. What can you do there? Uh, B can come out side to play like this. B times log A. So those are rules from college algebra that you learned about <coughs> logarithms. So that means, that means that another way to view this, this one, is you could say that's the derivative of something else. How could you rewrite the logarithm of 3x? Mm -hmm. The log of 3 plus the log of x. Now, let's imagine this for a moment. So, let's ignore this for a moment and observe that the derivative will distribute over the sum using the sum rule. What's the derivative of that? 1 over x. I think we are all in agreement there. What's the derivative of that? Zero. Why should the derivative of that be zero? It's a constant. The natural log of 3 is a constant. Now, you might object a little bit and say it's kind of a weird looking constant because I'm not accustomed to writing log of 3 and viewing that as a constant. But it is, isn't it? Because if I take a 3 here 
If I ask my, my calculator to tell me what it thinks about 3, how's it going to respond? It's going to tell me it's a 3, right? You've got a 3 there, right? What will it tell me tomorrow? <coughs> that it's a 3, right? Which is, which is one of the outstanding things about being a constant. It flatly doesn't matter what day I ask about the value of 3. Now, what if I type logarithm of 3? Well, my calculator is going to respond with 1.09 blah, blah, blah. What, am I, what is it going to respond with tomorrow? The same value, right? It doesn't matter what day I ask about the logarithm of 3. It's a constant. So, so this constant can be pulled out in that way. And yes, that's why. The answer is what it is. So what I want you to see <coughs> is that, in fact, the derivative of the logarithm of kx for any constant k is in fact 1 over x, where k is a constant. So you can make that the, the derivative of the logarithm of a million x or negative a million x. That would be just fine. So for example, what is the derivative of the logarithm of negative x? One over x. It's one over x because that's just exactly the same rule when you take the specific case when k is what? When k is negative 1. Right? It's just when k is negative 1. This works for any k whatsoever, so it surely works when k is negative 1. That's nothing for that rule. So, so here's where it all gets tied together. <clears throat> so this is kind of the, the general rule for derivatives. But the antiderivative rule is a little bit different. And in order to understand why the antiderivative rule looks the way it does, what I want you to recall is I want you to recall the definition of absolute value. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to write a definition of absolute value, which is a little weird. Um, not usually the way that you probably have seen it written. So the absolute value of x is 1 multiplied by x when x is greater or equal to 0. And it's negative 1 multiplied by x when x is less than 0. So now, let's see if this really is right. What's the absolute value of 5? 5. And isn't that 1 times 5? Yeah. OK. How about, what's the absolute value of negative 8? Eight? 8, you all say. But I'll say it's negative negative 8. Right? But isn't that the same thing? Of course it is. So to get the absolute value of a number, you always do one of two things to it. You either multiply it by 1, and that's the answer or you multiply it by negative 1. And that's the answer. So the absolute value of 10 is 1 times 10. And the absolute value of negative 13 is negative 1 times negative 13. OK? So what I want you to see is that it's always a constant, <coughs> either 1 or negative 1, times the input. <coughs> and as a result, The derivative of the logarithm 
of the absolute value of x is what? One over x. It's one over x. The reason is because there's two possibilities. We're either taking one times x or negative one times x. And in either case, one is a constant and negative one is a constant. And they all get canceled away when you do all the derivative work. And the answer is one over x. So this is the derivative rule. So now let's write down the corresponding antiderivative rule, which is to say, finally, what is the antiderivative of 1 over x dx? What is it? Not log of x. Not log of x like this. That's not right. It's log of absolute value of x. The reason why those red absolute values show up is for all that argument that we just made over the last five minutes. OK? <clears throat> Any question about this? Okay, so then I could ask a question. I could say something like, well, what's the antiderivative of 7x <clears throat> to 4 plus x squared over x to 5 dx? You could, you could, you could do that, but rather it's better to divide the denominator into each term in the numerator individually. So this is another case of perform all permissible and applicable algebraic simplifications before anything else. Algebra first, which is to say. We'll write it as 7x to 4, and then over x to 5, and then plus x to 2 over x to 5. That's the first thing we'll do. Then we can simplify uh, each one of these. So we haven't done any calculus yet. So the first term, how does it simplify? And I'll, I'll write that as 7 over x. Okay. How does the second one simplify? x to negative 3. So I went ahead and wrote this one this way because I know that exponent negative 1 is special and it's going to be log. Whereas I wrote this one in this way because I know that, e that exponent negative 3 is not special and I'm going to use the power rule for this one. Okay? So as for the second one, that's the easy one, so I'll just write it. So that's x to negative 2 divided by negative 2. And then I'll add the plus c. How do we handle this one? Mm hmm Very good. So the 7, that's the constant multiple rule. And then natural log of absolute value of x. Any question about all this? Any question about these things? Okay. So, in summary, 
you actually only know um, three antiderivatives at this point. You just know three of them, three general patterns. What you know <clears throat> is you know this one, you know this one, And e to x is just a special case of that one. And you know this one. So in a sense, these are the only three that you know. And somehow, all of the antiderivative exercises that I give you have to somehow break into these. Now, you know you know the sum rule and the constant multiple rule, which means that you could add two of these together. Or you could multiply them by constants. Or you could do both. You could multiply some of them by constants and then add them together. But in the end, as for the antiderivatives you know, it's just these three. We'll add a couple more as the semester progresses, maybe. But in the end, really, just these three. So. Now, the way a significant fraction of at least the beginning when we're talking about antiderivatives will go is that corresponding to every derivative rule is an antiderivative anti-rule. So we've talked about the sum rule for derivatives and therefore the sum rule for antiderivatives. We've talked about the constant multiple rule for derivatives and therefore the constant multiple rule for antiderivatives. The power rule for derivatives, the power rule for antiderivatives. The exponential rule, both ways. The log rule, both ways. So what's another rule that we haven't talked about yet? Another derivative rule. The quotient rule. We haven't talked about a corresponding antiderivative anti-quotient rule. In fact, there isn't one. <laughs> I mean, there is, there is one, but it's sort of subsumed by something else. So what's another rule? The chain rule. So that's a derivative rule, right? So that's what we're going to do next, except we're going to do the undoing of the chain rule. So chain rule is how you, is how you differentiate a composition. That's what it is. Remember we talked about it last week, where we were composing functions and saying, oh yeah, microscopes and everything else, all the other stuff we said about it, terrific. So when you, the derivative rule that tells you what to do with a composition is called the chain rule. Okay. So now, the next section we're about to do, according to the syllabus of Calculus 1, you've already done it, so it really is something that you, it really is review. But, can anyone here and now tell me, what is the anti-differentiation rule that undoes the chain rule? What is it? Substitution. U substitution. It's substitution. So, when you remember that from, I hope you remember that from Calculus 1, substitution. You did this process where you say, oh, U is this, and then D U is that, and you did some other things. Okay, well... That's undoing the chain rule. <laughs> now, I'd like, to, I'd like to make the following comment. What is with all these names? Right? In the end, we've got, we're dealing with functions, and you can compose them. And the way the derivative interacts with the, with the composition is called the chain rule? Why is that? Why would, <laughs> why would they call it the chain rule? I don't know. And... Then, well, I do know, but <laughs> it's, it's not relevant, really. And then, <clears throat> then, okay, you've got the antiderivative, anti-chain rule, and it's called substitution? Why is it not called the anti-chain rule? Or something like that. Well, in the end, the, the reason is, actually, because back in the day, 
right, when these things were being worked out originally, there was a group of people over there in that part of the world working on what, it, what amounted to differential calculus. They're doing derivatives over there. They're doing their thing. And they're coming up with their names and calling it whatever, chain rule. Then you've got this other group of people who are working on integration, something that we haven't talked about yet. And notably, integra integration and anti-differentiation are not the same thing. And I'll, I'll make clear the difference on Thursday, probably. But you've got this group of people working on derivatives over there. And this other group of people working on, on integration over there. Two different groups. And, they're, and these groups don't realize that, that they're actually very intimately related processes. They don't realize that differentiation is just the other side of the coin of integration. No one's figured it out yet. <laughs> and so all these people make all of their names for derivatives. And all of these people make all of their names <laughs> for integrals. And then it's only later that, that they realize, oh, <laughs> this is really the same thing. And now we've got at least two names for everything. <laughs> and now we're stuck with it. Isn't history wonderful <laughs> the, the way it is? <laughs> It's like in English, we have, a, we have like a word that's derived from German and from Latin for like every word. Really. We really, we really do, as a result of, of English or originally being a German word and then culturally dominated by Latin-speaking cultures. So we do have all of these. <laughs> well, yeah, but Spanish is a, is a derivative of Latin. That's what I mean. Is like, so we have all manner of words, and originally they're from Latin, but maybe by way of Spanish or French or Portuguese or all the other Romance languages. Yeah, and there's no fixing it at this point, right? There's, there's, <laughs> same with math, right? So it's going to be called the chain rule. <laughs> and it's going to be called, when you're doing the opposite of the chain rule, it's going to be called substitution. And that's just how it is. Okay. So, <clears throat> section 7.2, substitution. Substitution. Okay. So, <clears throat> if I ask you to differentiate say, the derivative of, of x squared plus 8 to 1, 3, 2, 6. 1, 3, 2, 6 is too big of a number. You have no hope of multiplying that out, right? You can never multiply that out, realistically. So that means that what must you use to, to, to answer this question? You're going to have to use the chain rule, right? So the chain rule is telling us that the derivative with respect to x, on the one hand, we have the power rule, which is saying if it was just an x, <coughs> if it was just an x, it's not, but if it, if it were, then the answer would be 1, 3, 2, 6, x to what exponent? 1, 3, 2, 5, right? Because you take one away. If it was just an x. But it's not just an x. It's a u. So uh, we'll call it a u. So the derivative with respect to x of u to 1, 3, 2, 6, assuming that u is a function of x, well, that would be 1, 3, 2, 6, u to exponent 1, 3, 2, 5. So, so far, it looks just like that one. But then for the chain rule, what's necessary? U prime, which I'll write as du dx. So this is the rule that we have to use to calculate this. Is there any question why that's the rule? <clears throat> OK. Therefore, it's 1, 3, 2, 6 this thing, x squared plus 8 
to exponent 1, 3, 2, 5. And then for the chain rule, I have to multiply by the derivative of x squared plus 8. <clears throat> so is there any question on how I got here? Okay, then, to, to finish the question, 1, 3, 2, 6, x squared plus 8 to exponent 1, 3, 2, 5 times 2x. Okay, so we computed a derivative and we used the chain rule. Here's a different question. What is the antiderivative of 1, 3, 2, 6, x squared plus 8 to 1, 3, 2, 5 times 2x dx? I claim that the answer is completely obvious. So what's the answer? Is that right? Is that? Because we took this and differentiated it and got that. <coughs> and I'm saying, well, what if you just take this and shove it back through the machine the other way? Well, you get that back, right? And then you get the plus c. x squared plus 8 to 1, 3, 2, 6 plus c. So the second question that I asked you was, in a sense, trivial as a result of having asked you this question first, <laughs> right? Now, if I, had just, if I had just cold called you and said, I need you to go ahead and do that, then you'd be in a little bit of a tight spot, right? Maybe you wouldn't know exactly what to do. So the purpose of this section is for you to be able to look at something like this and say, and, and be able to make sense of it and make your way all the way to here without having done this exercise in the first place. Okay? You've got to be able to undo the chain rule. So what I want you to see and the sense I want you to have is that when you look at this antiderivative here, I claim it kind of even smells like the chain rule, right? Because it kind of even looks like a derivative. It looks like the power rule was here, right? You've got 1, 3, 2, 6, and then, which is a strange number, and then you've got this other number, which is exactly one less. And, and those are in the positions exactly like the power rule had occurred. And then you've got this 2x right here, and 2x, well, that's the derivative of x squared plus 8. So you've got this thing here, and you've got the derivative of it out there exactly where the chain rule would have put it. So what I want you to see from this, from this expression, it's, it's like screaming, the chain rule was here. It smells like the chain rule. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out how can we, how can we undo the chain rule, undo the action of the chain rule. Okay, so any question before we get to it? Okay. <clears throat> so this is called substitution. Substitution. So <clears throat> the derivative of the composition f of g of x is, according to the chain rule, the derivative of f evaluated at g multiplied by the derivative of g evaluated at x. So that's, that's just quoting the, the chain rule. So what we can do is we can keep both of these things on the same side, on their same sides now, and just move the derivative to the other side. And write that f of g of x 
is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So what I want you to see is that these are on the same side. Let me write it like this. The red boxes are on the same side. The green boxes are on the same side. What I want you to do is move the derivative to the other side. Okay? And when you move the derivative to the other side, what does it become? Antiderivative. <coughs> antiderivative. So it is antiderivative dx. So what I'm telling you is that this derivative, when it moves sides, it comes over and splits into these, into antiderivative, and we denote it in two different pieces, that one and that one. Okay, so this is the substitution rule in all of its glory. Okay, now, <clears throat> probably best to uh, do this with an example. So how about the antiderivative of 3x to 4 plus 8, and then let's give it some big exponent, like uh, 10, so you'd never want to consider trying multiplying it out, and then 12x to 3 dx. Okay. <clears throat> So, what I want you to see here is that, in the first place, is this exactly one of those three antiderivatives that you know? So we wrote down that, those three antiderivatives. Is this exactly one of those? It's not. So that means that we're going to have to do a little bit of work to make it become one of those. Now, could you perform some algebra to make it be one of those? Well, in principle, you could, right? You could, multiply, you could actually carry out this exponent, right? Do this multiplied by itself 10 times, and it would just become, and then multiply it by that, and it would become an enormous polynomial. In principle, you could. But, but then, if I were to make it 100, then now you're starting to get to the limits of, you know, your hand, right? You're going to run out. Your hand's going to break. So how can we solve this without that? Well, let's, let's observe that this thing inside of the round parentheses, notice that its derivative is right there in the same place that the chain rule would have put it. Right? So what if we say that u is 3x plus 4, uh, 3x, sorry, 3x to 4 plus 8. Now let's compute u's derivative, du dx. Well, what is u's derivative? 12x to 3. And now, these things, du and dx, they have a special name that they're, they're what they, of what they are. They're not a variable, so x and u are variables dx and du are not variables, rather they're a different category of object called differentials. And they are not fractions. They're not fractions. And you can get in big trouble later, not in this class really, but you can get in a lot of intellectual trouble if you try and treat them as fractions. But, I'm, but I'll let you know that in this specific case, it's permissible and more or less safe to treat them like fractions, which is to say, I'm going to solve for du and write this. du is that. Now, what I want you to see <clears throat> is that if we do this, then all of this stuff in the red box, all this stuff in terms of x's, is going to be replaced with what? With u. So these are called the variables to substitute.
But this is a calculus question, and in the antiderivative, there are variables like x to 4, but there's also this. So when you substitute variables, you must also substitute differentials. You have to substitute them all. You can't substitute just variables. You can't substitute just differentials. If you substitute the one, you must substitute the other simultaneously. Which is to say that notice that all of this, all of this, variables and differentials, can be covered by what? du. Now, let's look at what's being anti-differentiated. Did we cover everything? Oh, these are, this is called the differentials to be substituted. We're almost done. Did we cover everything? Well, except the 10. But let's think here for a moment. Is 10 a variable? No, it's a constant, right? Is 10 a differential? No, it's a constant. So it doesn't need to be covered. Only the variables and the differentials need to be covered. And if you were to do that, then what would the new antiderivative be in terms of u? u to 10 du. And now you ask yourself, is this, is this one of the three antiderivatives that I know? Oh, it is, right? Because you just know three of them. So the answer is u to 11 over 11. Now here's the last bit. Is this the answer to the question, to the exercise? Right. Because the question was phrased in terms of symbol x, that means that your answer has to be phrased in terms of symbol x. Presently, it's phrased in, your answer is phrased in terms of what? u. So you've got to get it back to x's. So the answer to the question is 3x to 4 plus 8 to exponent 11, and then divide that by 11, and then add c. And this is called a variable differential substitution. And we're going to do a whole bunch of these next time. So have a nice Tuesday. <clears throat>